In the previous episode of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the players managed to foil the Doom Raiders as they attempted to steal loot from the auction at the Amcathra estate. They had managed to recover a clock from the auction, which had been put up by Never Remember and supposedly was another clue. The party had just fled from the Amcathra estate. While they were taking the carriage back to Waterdeep, galloping up to the door was, Maxine, Tuff said. The horse shook her head. Always the loud one, aren't you? But it's quiet out here. Can't get into any more trouble than I already have, can I? Haha. <laughs> the reason I've come back to you guys is that I'm going to be running off, leaving for the fields and go into hiding. I can't stay in Waterdeep anymore. But as one last thank you for freeing me, I need to tell you what I know. I need to pass the information off to someone else. First things first. You're looking for the Black Viper, right? Well, she works for Avarice, the Thieves' Guild. To the south, by the rocks at the outer wall, there's a false rock that leads into their headquarters. She's probably hiding out there, keeping an eye on the down low until the heat blows over. That, or you might find someone there who knows her whereabouts. Secondly, the reason I was being hunted was I had found out that the infamous Bregan Diarth Drow Spy Network was in Waterdeep, led by Jaraxel Banray. He's here because he's after the Vault of Dragons, hunting the Shards of Golor. I suspect that Zara Zord is probably working with them. He might be their face, if you will. Third, there's a spy who works for Manchun. The wizard has someone in the guards. An investigator. I pause for dramatic effect and wait for a reaction from the players. A dwarf investigator? Still no reaction. A dwarf investigator who's been passing information to Manchun? Still no reaction. Really? Okay, no, thought you guys might know someone like that, but apparently I was mistaken. The players thank Maxine, and she takes off into the rolling hills of Sword Coast. She was going to have to spend the rest of her days amongst the horses, being with her people. On the way back home, Zumbo decided to flip through his spells, and says, Hey, we're looking for the other shards of Golor, right? I see I just leveled up and can apparently talk to my god? Like, that seems broken. Can't I just ask my god where the shards are? And I as a GM say, yep, that's how that works. But I know Zumbo then when I had asked like, hey, who is your god? And we had just gone, oh, we'll worry about that later. Well, now is later, so we do actually need to know. At this point, I should remind everyone, since it hasn't been relevant till now, Zumbo is a Twilight Domain cleric, specifically the Twilight book series. So that's why I had to clarify, when you pray, who are you talking to? He thought about it. Stephanie Meyer, of course. Your god is Stephanie Meyer. Yes? Eh, that makes sense. So he starts a prayer to his god. Dear Lord, so great, pensmith, word weaver, your faithful servant, spreader of your words, and book. All right, I think I sucked your dick enough. We're fucking stuck. Uh, the Shard of Golor, like, is it in Waterdeep? You feel her hand on your shoulder and the soft whisper in your ear. Yes. Okay. Where's, where's the Shard of Golor? The players point out that the god will often speak through riddles or uh, mysteries, maybe even omens. So I, as the GM, kind of him and ha and think about it. Eventually I go, <clears throat> at the port of a skull, under the mountain. Well, that's a giant sack of shit. Thanks for nothing. And he hangs up on her. And the rest of the players were like, that's what you get for talking to Stephanie Meyer. What'd you expect? Like, she'd know where that is? The party goes back to talking, but Nana, the player, meanwhile, goes, Uh, I think I know where that might be from, but I don't know that my character does. And I'm like, okay, you're kind of a seedy fellow. There is a chance that you might know with a successful history check. She rolls. She succeeds. Okay, uh, you can tell the others if you want. Nana explains, I think your god might be telling us to go to Skull Port in Under Mountain, because it said Under the Mountain at the Port of a Skull. Zumbo was like, Are you kidding me? It can't be there. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Like, where else could it be pointing? Zumbo was incredulous. That's just way too on the nose. The thing is supposed to be cryptic, not rearranging some words and calling it a riddle. Okay, well, I'm sorry if it wasn't too clever for you. Oh, what now? It's not good enough for you. Uh, high standards. The players actually didn't think it was at Skullport because, air quotes, 
too obvious. Let's see you guys come up with a cryptic clue, huh? On the spot, all right? No respect, I tell you. No respect to these players. Derp derp, look at me. I'm a player. I can't remember to level up my character before the session. The party made it back to their home, discussing what to do. Val brought up, oh, What do you guys think we should do about the G-H-O-S-T? As he said that, the table started to move on its own, and he had to put his hand on it to keep it down. Most of the party doesn't know how to spell, so they don't get it. Tuff said, what do you mean, donuts? I love donuts. We eat them, of course. Ren agreed. We should make some up right away. No, 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 he clarified. I'm talking about the ghost. The entire house lurched back and forth, shuddering when he said that. The players decided to do a seance, casting a magic circle to pull the ghost in so they could either kill or question it. They turned down the lights, made a ring of calendars, and started chanting, forming the ritual. As they're chanting, the flames started to grow, and specters form, and they fight them. The house appeared to be trying to stop them from completing the ritual, but they managed to fend them off and finish the seance. Once it was done, two spirits appeared, floating in the magic circle. Val was like, Ugh! backing away into a corner. Nana asked, Excuse me, Mr. Ghost, we're wondering why you're haunting our house? My house. Tuff explained, But we, we bought the house. Doesn't, doesn't he know that? Ren asked, Let's start simple. What's your name? Liv. They asked, Okay, uh, Liv. How did you die? Murder. Haunted. Rarf, rarf. Next to him was a dog who piped up. There was a hunter in the night. Uh, who was it? They see a dark silhouette form in front of them. An orc with a bow and black arrows. As he floats in the air, turning, the players notice that he has a drool of blood down his neck and his throat like he was slashed. On his back, they see arrows protruding. With that, uh, the seance was over, they got the information they needed, the candles blew out, the two ghosts vanished, and it returned to normal. The players talked about it afterwards. Do we know anyone who was like that? An orc who uses arrows? No, I don't think we do. We might have to get some info before we can do anything. Uh, so the players never followed up on this mystery. Uh, we had a lot of other subplots going on, so I can just let you know what was the deal. In the Doom Raiders group that they had met the previous session, there's a guy who's an assassin. He's an orc who fires black arrows. Uh, currently, the players have a neighbor, uh, one who was trying to start a competing tavern, and in the book, he's just supposed to be kind of a friendly rivalry. In this version, I had him kill the previous owner, hiring an assassin to take him out. So one of the ways that the players... Uh, could get rid of the ghost was to avenge him, and that could be done in multiple different ways. One was just to out the neighbor for killing him and kind of bring him to justice, or to kill the assassin that took him out. However, the players already had a lot on their plate at the time, so they didn't have enough time to finish it. So that mystery never got solved. The house is just perpetually haunted. The next day, the players asked around at their neighbors. Apparently, the rumors about Lyf were that he had just up and vanished. There were stories that he had originally come out here to Waterdeep to open a tavern, but had moved away, then it failed. That morning, I let Val know, Ah, you're not feeling very well. Like, your hit point maximum has actually gone down. Ugh, why? Something odd happened. The normal, smoldering fire roared back to life. The flames singed the stonework above, making black, ashen lines. Amongst the flames, a face appeared. They would recognize Victorio Castellanter's face anywhere. You thought you could deceive me, he said. He holds up the fake rock that they had given him yesterday. From fighting them before, the players had discovered that the banking family were warlocks that worshipped Asmodeus. I don't know what you're talking about, the players pretended to play dumb. What? What are you talking about? Oh my god, that was a fake. That's so crazy. Victorio pointed out, you still bear the mark. Val looked down at his arm. The markings remained. 
That is a receipt, if you will, from your contract. You still owe me a shard of Golor for his freedom. No, no, we're not having it. You can't be thinking about just yourselves now, Victoria explained. You're not the only one who is bound by a contract. We were forced to give our children to Asmodeus. The only way to save them is we need to find the Vault of Dragons, claim the wealth that is there, and use the money to buy their freedom. We have one of the shards, but we need the other three. Surely you can find it in your hearts to help us save our children. The players were like, oh no, don't give me these crocodile cheers. You almost dropped his ass into hell. Very well. I tried to be nice. If you don't return the shard, in a few days, you'll be begging for me to take it. After all, I think you'll find that the deal has some very tight strings attached. <laughs> the fire died down, returning to its old state. The home was filled with a rolling, thick, black smoke. One last fuck you from Castle Lanter. The players had to open up the windows to air out the house. As he left, Val noticed that his feet felt odd. His skin got smoother. Rolls of fat started dripping down him. His legs started to change. His lower half fused together, making him become more slug-like. Ah, ah, he cried out. Aww, Tuff said. You're becoming a super cute slug person. But I don't want to be a slug. Tuff gently patted his shoulder. Well, maybe you'll learn to like it. The group discussed what to do, and they decide... We really need to deal with the Castle Lanters. Like, everything else can take us back birder. We need to deal with this. <laughs> also, by the way, they just dropped that they have one of the shards. We need to go get it. The problem that they realize is that among everything else going on, the Castle Lanter situation were very obviously the biggest threat. First, because they know where they are and could just roll into their house and cause trouble. And also because Val is being turned into a slug. Tuff clarified, which isn't a bad thing. It is a bad thing. The group decided that they needed to confront the Castle Lanters now rather than later. The party made their way to the Castle Lanters' estate, waiting till nightfall to make sure that the neighboring alleys had quieted down. As they hopped the fence into the Castle Lanters, I asked Zumbo a question that no player wants to hear. Can you make me a wisdom safe? Ah, shit. They said, what kind of fuckery is going on here? Zumbo makes his roll, and when he hops the fence, I say, Zumbo, uh, when you're breaking in, you actually have a shiver, and you feel like you're not supposed to be here. You almost had a jolt of fear making you leave just now, but you resisted and continue. The players were like, what the fuck? What the fuck? They made a bunch of stealth rolls sneaking across the grounds, to the window, into the window, and onto the first floor. They sneakily explored the ground floor. Nana captured one of the maids, tied her up, stole her clothes, and went around just as a maid, but with the long skirt hiding her tentacles. Also, they saw the Black Viper. She snuck upstairs. They actually realized, wait a second, we could use her as a distraction. If they're chasing her around, they're not chasing us. So they called out to the other servants, hey, who's that up there? The servants saw the Black Viper slip into another room and gave chase, clearing out the bottom floor. Then the party noticed that there was a secret door which went downstairs. It was the same one the kids had brought up in their story. The players went down a narrow and cramped spiral stone staircase. At the bottom of the stairs was a crypt with rows of sarcophagi along each wall. Once they entered the area, there was a glow of runes. Emerging from the sarcophagi were ghostly spirits with armor that drew their weapons on the players. As they were fighting, Zumbo was using a Zuredge, which was acting awkward and not quite helpful. Once they were done, they noticed that one of the spirits didn't fight them. At one of the crypts, they see a ghostly man in armor, kneeling before it. Ren cautiously approaches him. Hey, I don't know if you happen to have seen, but did you see a guy come here with a shot of Golo? The ghostly, armored spirit turns to them. Are you, of course, talking about my miserable son and his wretched wife? Then, yes, I saw them. They have the item you are looking for. Ren's like, uh, that's a, that's a mighty mean word to be slinging around there. My family, the Castle Lanters, is a poison. It has become infected and spread from place to place. I'll sigh to hear that, Ren said. 
What, what are you doing just hanging out here? Reflecting. Why are you not like the others? Why didn't you try to attack us? My son, for all his faults, still has a monicum of respect for his family. But the others, he has corrupted them and turned them. Who were they? My comrades in arms, servants of the Castellanta family that have been twisted by the powers of Asmodeus and used for his dark purposes. He looked to Ren. Do you oppose the forces of evil and push against the darkness? Uh, well, I'm just trying to help people where I can if you know what I'm saying. Then that is enough. He pointed to the wall where there was a mace, a shield, and plate mail. Those are my weapons. Take them. The poison that has become my family must be stopped. Their pain must end. As he says that, he vanishes. They take a second to identify the items. It's a plus one plate mail, a shield of fire resistance, giving everyone in a five foot radius fire resistance, and a mace of disruption. Uh, the mace does extra damage against fiends and undead, and when it hits a fiend or undead, the target makes a save or is instantly destroyed. Oh shit, Ren said, equipping all the items. Oh, it's on now. In the next room, he heard the screams coming from the neighboring dungeon. Oh wait, Tuff remembered. The toy bug, we could use that. Oh yeah, right. Zumbo remembered as well. At the auction yesterday, the party had gotten a bug that was attached to a mirror. This thing was kind of like a drone, which they could use to kind of fly around and see through the mirror and could use it to spy wherever. They held out their hand. The wings of the bug opened up and buzzed down and on the underside of the door to the other side. It let them spy inside of it. Within is a small chamber, a magic circle written in blood. Chained up is their oldest son, Osvaldo Castellanter. He's crying out, Mother, father, please let me go. I promise I'll behave. And then his eyes change and he speaks in a deep voice. Hate, I hate you. I hate everything. And they'll, they'll pay for what they did to me before changing back. They figure out that he's transitioning between being a devil and being their son, not quite between the two. The players talk amongst themselves what to do. That poor boy, Nana says, we have to get him out. Val panicked. Not now. We can't deal with this shit now. Nana explained, of course not now, just at some point in the future. While they were getting close to the castle lanterns, Ren had another idea. He took out a piece of stone and wrote, Golor, on it. Ren explained, I'll hold on to this and hand it over to them. Hopefully that will fulfill the deal. At least we got a backup now, in case it doesn't work out. <laughs> they have a conversation about Val, how he's doing like a sexy twilight transformation and how it's actually nice. As the group make their way farther down into the underground, into the belly of the beast, they start to sweat. Heat rolling up from the walls like the oven door is open. A continuous chanting grows. Nana scouts it out. They see a set of culty cultists in a culty circle wearing culty robes with two castle lanterns wielding culty daggers leading the chant. On the outskirts of the circle are a set of devils walking on all fours like hounds covered in spikes and razor claws and long fangs. In the center of the magic circle is the halting figure of a horned beast whose form is made up of fire and ash. This creature was a Baylor. It looked like the castle lanterns were doing some ritual to trap it and drain its powers. In the corner, they could hear the din of cries and screams. There was a blood portal opened up into hell. So I asked the players, okay, so uh, I just described the scene to you. This is what you guys see. Uh, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to try ambushing them? Maybe stealing or stinking around, something like that. Nana returned back to the group, suggesting, I have a plan. Ren asked, what are you thinking? She explained, why don't we just go home? We just go home. You know what? You're right. I know. Crazy, right? Us thinking we could handle it. We couldn't. We couldn't. We, let's just go home. We cut to everyone at home in the troll skull manner. Nana is knitting by the fire. Everyone's relaxing. Tuff is playing a game with the other kids. It's really peaceful. Man, it's a good idea we got out of there when we could. Like, can you imagine what would have happened if we had decided to stay there and fight? 
I know, fuck me, right? You know, like, that's, like, who are we thinking? We would have had to have been the biggest dumbasses to try and stay and fight. Everyone lets out a hearty laugh. Then they look over to Val, who's still slowly turning into a slug. You guys, what about me? All right, fine. I guess we do have to save Val. So the players went back to the manor, climbed the fence, broke back in, snuck around, got into the crypt again, and returned back to the stairs where they were listening to the chanting. Zumbo was like, balls deep, never pull out. Ren clinks his weapon to his, balls deep. The players rolled in there and started throwing their spells and attacks. It was a clusterfuck of a fight between the devils, cultists, players, and the castle lanterns. The players were intentionally trying to target the cultists, seeing if they could somehow disrupt the ritual. As the fighting went on, Val threw a spell at the castle lanterns. Victorio went, you have violated the rules. As such, you must suffer the consequences of your bond. As he said that, Val changed suddenly, from his half-slug form to being a full slug. Ugh, get me out of this! He was wiggling his slimy little arms. He tried to change forms using his druid wild shape. He changed into a bear for half a second before reverting back to a slug. No! Tuff was like, dare, dare now. I think you're going to just have to learn to be a slug. It's fine. Besides, you're super cute as a slug. Look at his little baby arms. He's almost like a person. <laughs> he says, crying, wiggling his arms. <laughs> Tuff explained, you know, maybe this was your angel's destiny after all. Amalia Castellanter shouts, you dare come challenge us? You will meet your doom. Even death will not be the end of your torment for you. Through the smoke and fire, Victorio Castellanter finally gets a good look at the adventurers, and his normally calm expression fades to terror. Eyes widen, shocked as if he's seeing a ghost. He goes, no, no, it can't be. His wife is just confused by his change. Darling, what's wrong? Why are you acting so strange? Uh, uh, uh. He starts backing away. No, you're dead. You're buried. I buried you. So, the armor which Ren is wearing is from his father, who's an old paladin. The weird quirk about the armor is Victorio sees the adventure, whoever's wearing it, as his father and is perpetually frightened of him, backing away going, ha, ah, ah, ha, no, you're dead, it can't be. Um, so Castlander is maintaining concentration on the magic circle. Ren throws a Zuridge at him and uh, Victorio goes to shield it. A Zuridge also has a weird quirk, uh, something I didn't think was gonna be relevant or not. Turns out it was relevant. So it has a Mage Bane ability, which lets it pierce magical wards and effects. So if it hits a spell shield, the thing actually just cuts through it and negates it. So Ren throws a Zuridge at him. He goes to shield it, goes through and hits him in the chest. This disrupts the circle and then frees the Baylor. The Baylor spoke to them. You have freed me from their capture. I shall now grant you a reward, that which is due. He points in their direction to, uh, rolls a die randomly. Val, roll me a charisma saving throw. DC, uh, let's go with a low 23. Val's like, no, no, nope. He rolls, ah, suck it, 24, charisma save. There was a brand which started to appear on his body, but he manages to resist the demonic corruption, going, nope, and swatting it away. <laughs> he just, like, flaps the magic away, which is, the brand disappears. Aw, that power had some really cool effects. He's like, I don't care at all. I'm done with all this devil bullshit. Well, he technically is a demon and not a devil, so Val does not care about that. It immediately started tearing into the cultists, turning them to ash. You thought your mortal magic was capable to hold me. You were mistaken. As it attacks the nearby cultists, they fall under his attacks. The devils themselves in the chaos turn tail and run, jumping into the portal back to Avernus. Eventually, the Baylor turned its attention to the two castle lanterns. It breathes fire onto Amalia, who collapses and dies under the blaze. Victorio gets snatched up by the beast and dies in an agonizing death before being immolated. As he perishes, Ren checks through the ash. Uh, do they have the Shard of Golor on them? Nope. I let him know. Okay, well, we'll have to deal with that later. He pulls the party's shard and he goes, Okay, so also I need to return this shard to you. Ren says, placing the shard in the pile of ash. He looks back to Val. Okay, so I fulfilled the contract. Does he turn back to normal? Nope. Shit. He snatches the shard of Golor back. 
The Baylor immediately turns his attention to the rest of the party. Val asked, we, 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 we cool, right? We helped you, you helped us out. The Baylor spoke, my master would feel very disappointed if I was in the mortal plane for so long and returned without fresh souls. Ah, oh, fuck. We cut to the group, running away at full speed. The fires of the Baylor hot on their heels. The demon was too large for this underground dungeon, tunneling through it on a bed of magma, blowing aside pillars and burning the rock. The party ran past the door with Osvaldo trapped inside. Tuff was like, wait, we gotta save him! The party broke him out and left with him. He seemed out of it mentally. They escaped from the manor and out into the lawn. Around the house, there was a crowd starting to form, as people noticed the roars, the rumblings, the bursts of fire. Through the chaos, the players saw the ghostly image of the paladin, Victorio's father, waving to them before vanishing. The attendants and servants fled from the house before the house caved in on itself, emerging from the implosion was the massive Baylor. The entire crowd cried out as they saw the beast with its fiery wings, wielding a molten sword in one hand and the whip in the other. The crowds cried and ran away, trying to escape from the chaos of the beast let out a roar. Across the city, there was another rumbling, as one of the walking statues rumbled to life. They hadn't moved in years, but now they were rising to deal with the Baylor. The party was like, well, we'll just leave this up to them. They probably got this. The walking statue fought the Baylor, throwing its punches at the beast's head. The Baylor, which had to retreat, tunneling into the earth on a magma channel. Once that was done, the statue returned to its normal waiting position. The party made its way back to the Troll Skull Manor. They managed to kill the two castle lanterns, but Val was still a slug. Guys, what do we do? Tuff suggested, how about you just learn to live with it? It's fine. I think you're my new slug baby. He said, holding Val in his arms and waving a little finger at him. No, I don't want to be a slug, he said, crying. Ren sat at the bar, defeated. I don't know what else we could do. The Castellantas are dead. How are we supposed to hand over the shard? He thought about it, and then he had an epiphany. Wait a minute. He called out. Kids, can you come down here for a second? The two Castellantas arrived. Yes, what is it? Ren realized that the deal was that they have to pass a stone over to the Castellantas. This just might work. Here, take this shard. Oh, you're giving this to us? No, not really, just hold on to it. Val piped up, nope, we're giving it to you, please take it, it's yours. As they took the stone and said that, Val popped out of his slug form, turning back to his normal Asimar self. They realized that in order to free him, they had to turn a shard of Golor over to the Castellanters. It didn't matter that the parents were dead. Aw, Tuff said, disappointed that Val returned to normal. The kids were like, well, we, we don't want it. Fine, we'll take it back. They snatched the stone back. The group was laughing amongst themselves, and the kids seemed pretty chipper. But soon, one by one, there was a silence coming over the party as the realization of what had happened dawned on them. Ren was like, so, uh, who, who wants to tell the kids what happened? Tell us what? They asked. As they explained to the shocked children what happened to their parents, that was where that session ended. Ended.